Let's see. Okay. Is Piper with us? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Well, I'm going to. There's Frank. Hi, Frank. I can't ever make mine scroll. Hi, Frank. <laughs> good to good. I don't see you, Frank, but I hear you. Welcome to Zoom. Enter your meeting ID followed by count. <laughs> oh. Oh. There's Martha. We haven't seen Martha in a while. Here I am. I'm hey. still. Hey, Martha. How you doing? Been making Very any well. quiches? How are you? <laughs> we miss your quiches. <laughs> I've still been making quiches, but not for y'all. <laughs> oh, I see. It's on mute. Okay, good. <sighs> Hi, Meg. Wait, did you say it's on? Hey, how's it going? Pretty good. Hi, Julie. Hey. Mm. Let me see. I'm going to give it two or three more minutes, and then we'll we will proceed. What you going to do for? Where's James, Julie? He's in El Paso with a busted up knee and really. Oh, oh, oh no. Yeah. Oh, gosh. So our, grow, our grown up kids give us a, a little heartache from now and then, don't they? Yeah, he, uh, he was part of a crew loading things onto a truck and someone, one of his privates threw a very heavy duffel bag oh, right into dear. his knee so oh golly golly i'm sorry hi joyce okay i um if i forget we're going to have our photograph made at the end of the program. And just before that, um, Piper has uh, something, a request she'd like to make. And so we'll just wait for that. Is everybody ready? How many do we have? Uh, 33. 33. That's pretty good. <laughs> Thanks, Martha. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, all, almost all of us, uh, or maybe absolutely all of us, know uh, who Allison Weaver is, but I'm going to read you an official introduction because she's pretty amazing. I can't imagine how she was able to squeeze us in for this program today because she has so many things that she does. But let me tell you a little bit about her background. Uh, Rice was sure lucky to get her. She is an art historian and former director of the affiliates for the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum in New York, where she oversaw the museum's programs and operations in Berlin, Bilbao, Venice, and Las Vegas. While at the Guggenheim, she managed um, the exhibitions management department registration, art services, and the library and archives. And along with curatorial colleagues, she implemented a, a wide range of international traveling exhibits. And then she came to Rice. She's the founding executive director of the Moody Center for the Arts at, the, at Rice University and, our, and also oversees Rice Public Art. Since 19, as 2019, no, 2015, excuse me, excuse me, she um, has overseen the, oh, she has, she, she oversaw 
the design and construction of the five fifty thousand square feet art center. And I went to the um, the commemoration of the building or whatever they call it, dedication of the building. And they did a wonderful thing. And I bet you anything, Allison had a hand in it. They thanked all of the maintenance and personnel that help with construction on the Rice campus and are employed by Rice. And I thought that was wonderful because we got to see the worker bees and it was, it was a great day that day. Um, since she's been here, she has been fostering a program of transdisciplinary collaboration between the arts, sciences, and humanities. She's completed a capital com campaign and launched an endowment. She concurrently led the expansion and diversification of Rice's public art collection, adding more than 21 works and initi initiating three rotating public art programs. And that was all she, her, oh, she brought with her terrific credentials and, a, and a, is a genuine treasure for Rice University. She has a BA cum laude from Princeton University. She holds advanced degrees in art history from Williams College and City University of New York. She also holds an MBA from Yale School of Management and gained ex executive experience as a consultant at McKinsey. And reading all of that has made me totally out of breath. <laughs> she is the current co-president of the Houston Museum District Association and serves as a trustee for the Texans for the Arts. Congratulations on all that you do, Allison. And um, we are so happy to have you today. So Amanda, you are gonna help Allison get started? Thank you so much, thank you. Thank you, Karen, for that warm introduction, and I really appreciate it. And I will say maybe my most important credential for our purposes today and maybe for my, my job here at Rice is that I am the daughter of two proud Rice alumni. So both oh. of my parents, Ralph and Carol Weaver, went to Rice, and I grew up. Um, I learned to drive in the parking lot. I did high school papers in Fondren Library. Um, and my uncle went to Rice. So, you know, there's sort of a long and storied connection there that definitely played a big role in my returning um, to help launch the Moody, which is just seven short years ago. But with that, I will share my screen um, because as an art person, we, I like pictures and I hope that you do too. Um, and I prepared some for you today. And what I thought I'd talk about specifically today is public art at Rice. So I, I, my, my official title is the executive director of the Moody Center for the Arts. And we're very proud of opening this gorgeous building where I'm sitting now. But concurrently, um, we've had the opportunity to build on a, a wonderful tradition at Rice of placing art on campus. And many of you have experienced that tradition, have lived it, have uh, been there for it, have walked the campus, and it's really accelerated in the last five years. So I thought it might be nice to kind of catch everyone up to both what's come before, if you're not as familiar with the history, but especially what we've been doing in the last five years, because we've really been activating uh, the campus with art in places where people live and work and learn and, and study and visit. So it's in many ways transforming the campus just as the building and architecture program has transformed the campus um, over these last uh, years under David Liebren. So I'm going to start with a little bit of a background. I, well, first I should just pause there. Is, it, is there any, are there any questions before I get going? And I just want to make sure everyone can see these images since I'm going to be speaking to pictures. I can see it. Okay, great. Well, and feel free to jump in if, if for any reason you can't hear me, but I'll talk for a little bit and then I would love to open the floor and hear from all of you um, questions and comments about your own experiences with Rice Public Art. Um, but historically speaking, I just want to 
highlight a couple of things that have happened over time. Um, you know, really the first gift of public art, which is uh, which we don't talk about so much. And I, I should say that um, I'm gonna talk today about public art as a collection separate from the statue of William Marsh Rice, which is on campus, but we, we don't consider really so much a, a part of the public art collection so much as a part of the historic, the history of the campus as both a burial site and a statue. And obviously that's been a big point of conversation these last couple of years. I'm gonna table William Marsh Rice for today, but I'm gonna talk about all the other works on campus that we know and love. Um, starting with the very first gift, which is this work called The Sisters by a Danish artist named Carl Millis. It was uh, first created in 19, 1952 and then cast in 1969 and brought to Rice um, for a, spe a specially designed memorial garden at Jones College, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with Jones, um, as a gift from Joseph and Ida Kirkland Mullen and all the Lovett children. And it's, I think it's a, it's a really interesting, um, both a sculpture and a fountain that um, was in fact the first gifted art to artwork to Rice and, and became de facto the founding work in a collection, even though that wasn't what was originally intended. Um, the first commissioned work, and I, I'm gonna make a distinction today between acquisitions and commissions. So when we acquire a work of art, we're purchasing something that exists in the world and bringing it to campus. And we do that a lot. There are other times when we invite an artist to make a site specific work and that we term a commission where we go to an artist and say, here's a wonderful spot. And could you think creatively about what might happen in dialogue with the teaching and learning that goes on around that site? And in this case, um, in 1984, and I should have it here on the label, Alice Pratt Brown commissioned one of our nation's most important land and space artists, Michael Heiser, an artist still living today, to make this work 4590-180, which he milled from Texas granite and Marble Falls and trucked to Houston. Apparently a highway had to be shut down for their, their three large slabs, like this image only is showing you two of them, but they're positioned at those angles, 4590 and 180 degrees. And they really respond to what's happening in the engineering quadrangle um, and some of our most historic buildings, including Maxfield Hall. Um, and now just adjacent to it, we're building a new building, which will also include public art um, adjacent to these works. But that was the first commission on campus in 1984. I will say between 1984 and 2008 was somewhat of a fallow period in our public art growth, shall we say. But around 2008, a group of alumni, and I wanna emphasize that it was really alumni driven. And I think that's so, important, um, both those initial two gifts that were given by Rice, uh, the Rice family, if you will. Um, and then a group of alumni around 2008 led by, I just want to um, acknowledge Raymond Brockstein, who, who passed a couple of weeks ago, and was truly one of the leaders and visionaries in thinking about the Rice campus as a 300 acre opportunity for, for incredible works of art. So around that time, Raymond and others gathered together and they went around the United States to other campuses. They visited Princeton and they saw the artwork on that campus. They visited um, a wonderful collection at UCSD, uh, University of California at San Diego has a fantastic work of public art. And they came back and said, you know, we've got opportunity here. There's, there's a lot of space and a lot of beautiful landscape. Couldn't we bring more art to campus? And at that time, um, a, a group of alumni got together and began to both commission and request gifts of works of art. And 13 new works were added between 2008 and probably around 2012 or 13. And I'll just show you, and this is kind of a map of where they've they landed that initial group. Um, and some of the works are on the right here. Um, this wonderful Jeffrey Dashwood, which is a mon monumental barn owl. Um, this James, two James Searles works, the Plenso. Let me see, I think I have a couple more pictures. The first in that grouping um, is a work by Lino Taglia Pietra, an important glass artist from Italy um, who made this work Endeavor specifically for the site um, at the request of Albert and Elizabeth Kidd, I'm sure many of you know. And that was really the first of this round of commissions that happened between 2008 and 2012 and now graces our library next to two wonderful paintings by Dorothy Hood. 
Um, at the same time, around that time, this work by Leo Villarreal was commissioned. Um, this work was gifted by Bill and Stephanie Sick, Bill, class of 57. It's a, a work by Plensa called Mirror in 2011, from 2011. And many of you know it well, it's sited adjacent to the Braxton Pavilion between there and Herring Hall, and really provides an, a wonderful moment of engagement both during the day and in the evening. And one of the things that public art does, I think, is bring the campus to life in the evenings because many of our works are lit and um, create a kind of dynamic engagement with the landscape um, at different points through campus. Um, so th this was a wonderful group of works that it also included this work on the right by Mark de Suvro, one of our, our nation's most important large scale sculptors. Um, and it was a gift of uh, Becky and Ralph O'Connor. It's a kinetic piece, it, it rotates slightly. It's been a couple different locations. We moved it from adjacent to the Art School of Architecture to where it lives now, which is adjacent to the Moody Center for the Arts, which you see in the background. And I just wanted to note that in addition to bringing these works of, onto campus, we're always looking for ways to activate the works. And I'll, I'll speak a little bit more in a minute about some of the temporary programs we've brought, but this is something we did in 2020 during the pandemic when we couldn't be indoors. We commissioned um, five Shepherd School students to write original compositions responding to the public art on campus. And then they performed those commissions and we made videos of them. And then we released the videos. So kind of a way to both um, bring the arts to our isolated community at that time, and also to give Shepherd School students a new, a new opportunity and to bring renewed attention to these works of art that, that we some of us walk by every day. Um, and then of course, the capstone of this round of commissions was really the James Terrell Twilight Epiphany Sky Space, a gift of our alumna, Suzanne Del Booth, class of 77. And I'm sure all of you have been to the sky space and you know that it is our most public and most frequently visited work on campus. It's frequently cited in publications, large and small, as one of the top attractions in Houston. It's been featured in the New York Times, you know, 48 hours in Houston, the number one thing to do is to come to the Terrell sky space. Um, and it's really a, been a welcome, a symbol of welcome, I think, for the university. It has brought people to the campus that wouldn't otherwise know that it was for them. And I think one of the most important things public art can do is help open rice up to the community. And it can be a space where all visitors are welcome, whether they're from afar or from our backyard, um, but are welcome to come. And this is, you know, we just celebrated the 10th anniversary of the Sky Space, which is this year. And we invited James Terrell to campus. We had a really lovely um, dinner. And I will note that James Terrell's granddaughter is a student at Rice. She's currently a sophomore studying electrical engineering of all things, and she's wonderful. And James Terrell spoke beautifully about the sky space and he said two things. Um, the first, two, he said that it's one of his most important sky spaces because it is so public. So it's really like a public park. It's open all day, every day. And, it, and the sunset sequence, it, it, this, the light sequence plays at both sunrise and sunset. And he really um, appreciates that it's not either inside a private institution like a museum or a private building or on private property. Sometimes he does them for um, private collectors or others, but it's really open to the public. And I think it makes a really special statement for the university. Um, and the second thing he spoke beautifully about the, the importance of building culture for the future generations, which was meaningful with his granddaughter there. But this idea too, that public art becomes um, a durational part of our experience as we transition through the campus. And that might be a student over their four years here really has a different relationship with a public work of art that they get to know over time than they have with a, with a work of art that they would get to know in a museum like setting or in the Moody Center for the Arts where it's a temporary project. And we love those too, but they have a different sort of effect. And I think it's really worth thinking about how public art influences the imagination in a durational way, because I think that makes it really distinctive and, and um, argues for the importance of it across the campus and in these different spaces. Um, and I just wanna say the other great thing about our, our Terrell um, sky space is that we are able to activate it with music and dance. And we had, we commissioned a dance project when we opened the Moody in 2015, I'm sorry, 2017. And we have a new dance commission, I will just say our second one 
will be next weekend, April 22nd and 23rd. We are bringing a choreographer from New York named Carol Armitage, and she's bringing six dancers from her company. And we've invited 18 volunteer dancers from both the Rice student body. There'll be, I think, nine student dancers dancing with members of the Houston dance community, which includes um, some of our dancers from Houston Ballet and from other dance, other modern companies. And the idea that these spaces can be a site where the campus and the community come together around the arts. And we work, we work together closely with the Shepherd School to activate this with, with both art and music. And what you can't see in the interior of the sky space is that it contains an embedded speaker system. And we are able to um, host a wide range of concerts and compositions and performances by both students and uh, professional artists. So it's been a really generative space over the last decade. You can see all the works in our collection on both the Moody website where we've we've created a, um, a, a listing which has detailed information about all of the work. So if you just go to moody.rice.edu, you can really scan through everything that we have. And I think it, it's constantly growing. So I encourage you to, to do that. Um, and um, I just wanna point out some of our most recent acquisitions. So in the last five years, I would say we've created a secondary burst. If our first burst was starting in 2008, we are now on a, uh, a mission to, to activate the collection with new work. And Karen, I know you spend time in the, in the Glasscock School, but we were delighted to, to bring this work by Solowit, one of our country's most important conceptual artists. Um, it's called Wall Drawing, number 11115. Um, circle within a square with both broken bands of color. And this is a work of conceptual art, meaning the artist um, creates a diagram, which is then implemented by different parties. So we actually brought artists to make this work. Solowit is no longer alive, um, but he allows for the interpretations of others. And I think what's so interesting in a site of learning like Glasgow School, to have a conceptual piece that plays it forward in terms of inspiring future creativity and also is based on the idea. So at the core of this artwork is the idea of the artwork, um, which he generated, which Solowit generated in 2004. And it was a very generous gift by Russ Pittman, um, class of 58, who I'm sure also many of you know. Um, and I think it's really, it's really been, the history of public art is very much associated with the history of our alumni. Um, and the next one we, we brought, we, this was an acquisition. We have a couple of really important acquisitions. This one by a woman artist originally from Poland named Ursula von Reidingsward, which is sited adjacent to, it's behind the Allen Center between the Allen Center and the Cambridge office building. And we've worked closely with our, our landscape architects, office of Jim Burnett to site and light these works of art. And I think it's really important just to point out that you know, one of the reasons we chose this work in particular was for the correlation that it has both in texture and color and form with both the St. Joe brick on campus and also the oak trees, which frame it on the other side. As you, you can see a little bit to the right of your screen, there's a grove of oak trees and they almost embrace um, this work with which in Polish, Maluczka means a uh, little dear one. It's a feminine um, term for the little dear one. And this artist um, cast this work at her studio in Brooklyn and then brought it here and cited it for us uh, together with the office of Jim Burnett um, in I think a really special, special location. Um, we also recently cited, speaking of the grand opening of the Opera House just this weekend, in between the new Brockman Hall and the existing Alice Pratt Brown Hall, we brought a work by Beverly Pepper and she is an American artist. Um, this is a 30 foot core 10 steel work called Occam's Wedge named after the famous maxim of Occam's razor, which is the rule that the simplest solution is often the best one. And I want to, I just want to say a word about what we are thinking about when we select these works. And I, there's a, there's a process whereby they're selected. It goes through a lot of um, conversation. There is a public art committee. We also work closely with the constituencies of the school or center that is um, the adjacent or commissioning group. So in this case with the School of Music. Um, and we, we start with a long list of artists then through a series of conversations with 
the, the school with the public art committee, with the administration, we narrow it down and select either a work for acquisition like this one or a commission um, like, uh, let's see, uh, well, I'll show you a couple of commissions in a minute. Um, but it's a, I would say our goal in doing so is both um, to engage the campus community, but also to build on the strengths of the current collection. So what we're trying to do is our strengths really stem from those early works, from that Michael Heiser's 459180 from the James Terrell. And these are works that emphasize land and space as well as light and geometric abstraction. So we look for artists that work in those vocabularies, but from very different perspectives. We wanna diversify the perspective of artists to better reflect the student body at Rice and the citizenship of the city of Houston. So we look to bring more voices by women, by international artists, by artists of less represented communities. Um, so that's all of those factors triangulate toward um, the acquisition of major works like this one. And Beverly Pepper is, a gen is the same generation as James Terrell. She came out of that same movement, but uh, was one of the few women artists working in large scale outdoor sculpture. Um, so we were very happy to be able to um, work with her. This was the last piece she designed before she passed in 2020. And we were able to acquire it with the help of her daughter, um, Jory Finkel, who's a Pulitzer Prize winning poet and um, stated that her mother loved both opera and Texas and would have been delighted to have this work cited at Rice next to our School of Music. Um, we also brought um, the work, a work by the first black artist in our collection. Charles Gaines is a really important American artist. He's the head of the art department currently at UCLA. And this is a work we just placed in uh, Maxfield Hall, which was newly renovated. Um, and it's called Numbers and Trees Tear Garden Series 3. And what I, I wish I had a little bit more of a close up, but what you can't see on the right is that the tree is comprised of numbers that the artist creates through a rule-based system. He, he has a kind of internal regulatory system that he then results in these layered pieces on paper and acrylic. And we thought that would be really appropriate for the school statistics, which offices right here. So having, again, that relationship between both what we hope to achieve for the broader collection, um, but also when we hope that these works will speak very clearly to the, the school or center in which they're they're living and working. Um, so we're very happy to have this work by Charles Gaines. Um, we also commissioned for the very first time a Rice faculty artist. So Natasha Bowden is part of our visual and dramatic arts department. She's a fantastic young artist. Um, that's her walking across the work. And this is a work called Power Flower, which is in Anderson Hall, the School of Biology. And Anderson Hall approached us when they did a renovation, wanting to put art in the space and we, we ended up showing, we showed them a wide range of artists, all of whom work with natural uh, concepts. And they ended up selecting Natasha's work. And it's a really vibrant uh, wall-based piece. It actually comes off the wall. It's comprised of, of both vinyl and painted panel in this extremely organic um, patterns that mimic the natural world, but obviously from a very man-made um, perspective. And I think it was, it was exciting for us and important for us to also acknowledge the Rice faculty um, through this public art commissioning process. So hopefully find your way over to Anderson Hall. You have to kind of work your way there. It's behind the geology building. Um, we also commissioned um, this work for the new Sid Richardson College um, called Scythe by a, a London-based artist named Shiraze Hushiari. And again, we worked closely with the office of Jim Burnett to cite it, I think beautifully in the landscape together with the planted trees around it and the light emanating. And, um, it is a twisting glass tower. And what uh, Shiraze wanted to do, this was commissioned for the space. She had a couple of things in mind. One is the prevalence of St. Joseph brick on campus. So she wanted to echo those bricks, but working this time in these handmade glass bricks. They're handmade in Murano, Italy, and they have that same special characteristic that the St. Joe brick, brick has in, in terms of being both um, a regular form, but very unique. Each one is handmade. And she chose this color palette of greens with yellow to reflect the way light filters through the oak trees on campus. So as you walk the campus on a beautiful day and you experience that dappled light, 
And we have so many of our visitors come and they just love the trees, right? And the, in the summer, they're life-giving. And she had the exact same experience when she came and visited from London. And so she wanted to create a piece that echoed both the architecture and the natural environment while working with light and geometric abstraction. So for us, this meets all of our criteria and Shiraze is an Iranian born artist. Um, so bringing a very, uh, very diverse voice um, to our campus. So these are, the, these are the things in which we hope um, both bring beauty and interest, but also a kind of um, art historical background. And, and these, we, I would say are major works of art that we're, we're very happy to have on campus. Um, we've also recently commissioned with the Baker Institute um, a series of murals on the second floor. So I would encourage you next time you're on campus to wander upstairs at Baker, which is open. You're welcome to walk in. And Ganzir is a, um, became well known as a street artist during the Arab Spring. He lived in Cairo. And then his wife um, got a position at the Baker Institute. She's a global expert on the refugee crisis and particularly on women refugees. And so they moved to Houston as a, it's a classic story. So many people come here for wonderful reasons and especially when they come for reasons that involve rice. And so we, com we had commissioned um, Ganzir to make a work at the Moody during the pandemic. This was, some of you might've seen this in the summer of 2020. On the, we turned our galleries inside out and essentially put art on the exterior. So people using the campus for public space could enjoy. And he created this work called It Takes a Village which really spoke to the need for community and support during the time of isolation and COVID. And so when he came, but when he came to work at the Baker Institute, he reflected what's going on in the different institutes in the, in the building. So they, the Institute for Latin American Studies, the Institute for Energy, the Institute for the Middle East, um, the way in which um, Ed Derigian has really devised the, the intellectual focus of the building is now reflected in this extremely vibrant, um, you know, streetlight art, which he actually invited the fellows at the Baker Institute to participate in making. So that was really exciting. Um, we also at the Baker Institute acquired four prints by James Terrell. And I think that this is in a conference room overlooking our Twilight Epiphany sky space. And I think this, when we do, when we're able to do something like this, it also enhances things from a pedag pedagogical perspective because students writing about or studying James Terrell are able to both visit the sky space and experience a major work of public art, but also see a lesser known part of his practice, which is his, his uh, print series. And he's a fantastic printmaker, really a master printmaker. And the one on the right called Meeting is the only print he's ever made about a sky space. And it was inspired by the first sky space he did, which was at PS1 in New York, at part of, now part of the Museum of Modern Art. Um, but yeah, these are really special works inside the Baker Institute. So we're, one of the things that's happened over time that is so exciting is that we've had, we've started to have different parts of campus come to us, come to the public art group and say, we'd really like to talk about how public art could help us. So that's been great. I'll speak a little bit more about that in a second. There have been two works um, donated by one of our recently departed alumni, Ricky Ray Barron, class of 77, gave this important work by Emily Mason, an early American abstractionist or 20th, 20th century abstractionist. And many of you might know this work, which is at, at um, Cohen House. So Waves Column is by Jesus Morales, a Texas artist. And it's been out, it's been sitting out um, in the beautiful courtyard outside of Cohen House for quite some time um, on long-term loan, which is also a way in which we can engage with art from the community. We, we don't always have to acquire it. Sometimes we just borrow it. But this work uh, we borrowed from Ricky Ray um, for the last at least decade. And then he, he eventually gifted it to the university, which was a really nice um, gesture. And I think it's a really uh, beautiful site for it to, to be. Um, but as I was saying, different, different schools on campus have started to come to us. And one most recently is McNair is the Jones School. They've recently refreshed McNair Hall. They've done a complete renovation on the interior of the building. And as part of that, the Dean, Peter Rodriguez came and said, you know, I really think how art can help signify the kind of teaching and learning we're doing in this building and the global perspective we hope students will have once they've graduated from the School of Business. And so we've embarked on a series of commissions and acquisitions specifically for the Jones School, but fitting into the larger 
pro the larger collection, of course, starting with this work um, called Triple Virgo by American artist Pay White. She's a California based artist. And she created this piece made up of um, metal discs that are suspended in a globe like form. And she talks about it wanting to inspire the curiosity of students as going out and exploring the world and, and hopefully solving some of the world's problems. <laughs> we, we're putting our faith in the next generation. Um, but we also recently commissioned this work by Kate Shepard called Tricycle Red, and she's um, picking up on the architectural form in the building, both the red tiles that you see in the foreground, and also the dimensions of the rotunda where the pay white is just adjacent to that pay white. So this is immediately outside the door of the admissions office. So as you come out of your conversations with the admissions, you're met with a really um, unique work of art. And I think that hopefully signals the way in which Rice is a site of creativity and um, innovation. And then we acquired these four works for a, another hallway in the Jones School. So they are each speaking to that light and space. This hallway, in fact, the windows of the hallway look over onto the Terrell Sky Space. So you can see the work on the upper right by Spencer Finch, which is in fact a light-based work um, called uh, Gold, uh, Goldberg, Vari it's a study for Goldberg variations. It's, uh, it's relating also to music. Um, the work by Jose Davila on the left, who's an artist from Guadalajara, Mexico. Um, the work on the lower left is by Beverly Fishman. She's an artist based in Philadelphia, and it's a, a commentary in an abstract way on um, big pharma and our, what our country is facing in, that, in, uh, in terms of addiction. And then the work on the lower right by Carmen Herrera, who's an artist from Cuba, working in a minimalist vocabulary, but um, very much in dialogue with all of the rest of the works. And actually Carmen Herrera um, lived to be 101 and, and just passed away this year. But these are major works um, that we are delighted for students, both in the Jones School and across the campus to get to know. Um, so then I'll, those are all works that we've added permanently. And I'll just, before I go, before I go in, I want to, I do want to say something about how we add these permanent works and how we underwrite them. Sometimes they are gifted by, often by an alum, but other times we have what's called a percent for art program. So it was passed around that time of 2008. There was an initiative to dedicate a very small percentage of a new building construction budget to public art. And this is something that David Liebren supported, the Board of Trustees supported, um, and of course the, the facilities, uh, buildings and grounds team supported. So it has led to several of the works I just showed you. What often happens is the percent is sort of a seed and then we additionally raise money on top of that. It's a, it's a, it's a small number, but it's I think um, important as an indication of the value that the institution places on adding art and including it as we continue to expand the campus. So there's a percent for art program occasionally, and then there are other times when we either fundraise or, or solicit gifts from our, um, our community and, and alumni body. So that, because that often is the question is how do we pay for these things? And that's how we pay for them. Um, I'm also proud of the fact that starting five years ago, right after we opened the Moody, we began, um, two temporary public art programs. So all the works I've just shown you are permanent. They're on campus forever. You can see them on the website, but it's also an exciting idea to think about interstitially engaging in parts of campus in temporary ways, in ways that come and go. They don't have to be permanent. They don't have to, you might love them, you might hate them. It's okay, they're gonna go away. So um, in, this, in this way, we started two, two programs. Um, one of which is in the Brockstein Pavilion and very much with the support of Susan and Raymond and their daughter, Deborah and her husband, Stephen. Um, but it's called Off the Wall at the Brockstein Pavilion. And we were faced with this enormous wall. It's on the, uh, it's facing south in the building and you can really see it from the exterior with all the windows around. And what we decided to do was partner with the Museum of Fine Arts Houston. One of our goals is that we hope we can very much Rice can be a partner with the cultural district here, that we are working closely with the Manil, with the Museum of Fine Arts, the Contemporary Art Museum, the Buffalo Soldiers Museum, the Contemporary Craft Museum. I mean, there's just so many institutions we can work with. And in this case, we're partnering with the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, specifically their Core Fellows Program, which some of you might know, it's like a postdoc for artists. And they bring some of our top young artists from all over the world to Houston for two years for a program at the museum. 
And then those artists go off and go back out into the world, either to one to to back to New York or back to South America or back to Berlin or wherever they're from. And so we thought, wouldn't it be great if we could bring an artist back who knows Houston and knows Rice, but can bring them back to us and they can make a work for this site. And it's only on view for one year. So it's a temporary rotating program. And in this, the first one was uh, Harold Mendez, who you see on the right, who's an artist from Latin America. And he actually worked with students to make the work, which was really exciting. These are photo-based series, which he then overlays with charcoal. You see the students on the right applying charcoal to the surface of the photograph, which are then mounted on aluminum and then mounted in this wall-based series, which creates a kind of dynamic effect. Um, and these are images that were taken at the border between Texas and Mexico um, and have a lot of uh, resonance with themes of immigration and migration and um, policy and that kind of thing. So a lot to talk about, but also just a really gorgeous work to look at um, and really exciting that this great young artist can be here and get to know Rice students. Um, the second work was this, it was, it's called Ocean Modifier by an artist named Sandra Perry. And she studied um, the flooding that happens in Houston's Freedman's Town. And she contrasted that with um, William Turner's Slave Ship, which is an important 19th century painting I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And she took that slave ship painting and made this lenticular panel, which goes across the center of the wallpaper, um, contrasting the sort of flooding that happens in Freedman's Town and some of the environmental uh, discrepancies um, according to income. Um, that have happened across Houston and other cities with the history of art and um, really a beautiful and dynamic and, and rich work that she installed largely during the pandemic. So I, many of you may not have seen this one. It was on view while much of the campus was closed. Um, but we were able to it was closed by inviting two of our, our HSPBA graduates and two of our nation's top jazz musicians right now, Brandon and Dalton Lee. They played an incredible performance there in response. And this whole idea, we're always thinking about ways to activate the public art collection and with, with performative responses. Um, and what's on view right now, I encourage you all to stop by and see it. It is a work by Clarissa Tossin. Um, she's a Brazilian artist and she made this work together with scientists from the Rice Space Institute. Some of you might know David Alexander and with scientists that we connected her to at NASA, particularly Dr. David Kring, who's uh, got a big position at their planetary, Lunar and Planetary Sciences Institute. And these are images of the moon, areas that can be mined for polar ice. And polar ice is what is going to fuel the future expansion to Mars. They can mine it for hydrogen and use that for fuel to travel to Mars. And she took these gorgeous images from, provided to her from our scientific colleagues and she turned them into tapestries. You can't see it here, but I hope that you'll go and, and visit this work in person because they're, they're almost like Renaissance or Baroque tapestries. And it's a commentary in some ways in the way in which tapestry, tapestries signaled wealth in, a, in those uh, eras, earlier eras. Um, she's commenting on the way in which we're mining, not just our natural resources on earth, but the natural resources of the the, of outer space <laughs> and then kind of bragging about it and ways in which that's both the next frontier, but also something we wanna to attend to um, from a conservation and sustainability point of view. And she was able to come and give a talk and meet with students. And now what she, what she uh, you'll hear her in a second because I'm gonna show you a very brief video, but I, it's a real, we love that we can encounter students where they, and, and visitors where they're working and studying and having coffee and that gives it a really a um, little bit of a different tenor than if you're going to a museum. Um, we also, our second temporary series is called Platform. And in this one, we interstitially engage across campus. We invite artists to respond to the architecture on campus in creative ways that are temporary. They just come and go and they might influence your experience while you're here. This one we did during the pandemic with a Dutch collective called We Make Carpets. And we, they were on Zoom from the Netherlands and we had a body of students and volunteers who tied these ribbons to one of the temporary tent structures on campus to create, um, and each of the segments of ribbon are six feet. So it was a challenge to see if we could create an artwork that would encourage social distancing while still bringing joy at a time when I think we all needed 
a little bit of happiness and, and uplift. And so this was a really wonderful project that um, we made together with artists, with students and, and community volunteers. And then it was on view just for uh, that academic year during 2021. Um, this was another one by an artist named Mina Kachadorian. It was in the trees adjacent to Braxton Pavilion. It was, uh, I won't, I, I'm going to move forward a little bit more quickly, but it was a really, it was a first sound work on campus. Sound art is a kind of another frontier of the arts, and it was really interesting to activate the trees on campus with a work of sound art. Um, and then we have now, if I can go forward one more, whoops, sorry. Um, this is what's currently on view. If you're near the School of Architecture, Anderson Hall, this is a Puerto Rican artist named Edra Soto, who we built these, um, these panels in our workshop here at the Moody, and each panel has a viewfinder. And in the viewfinder, you'll find an image of vernacular architecture from Puerto Rico. And in fact, the pattern of the panel is also echoing a common fence pattern that you see in the barrios in Puerto Rico. And so this artist is really bringing her own view of her, the architecture of her home country into the School of Architecture. And so we thought it would be interesting. Uh, we invited her to do something. This was what she came up with. And it's been a really wonderful partnership with the School of Architecture and hopefully in an, uh, an interesting way in which students there can um, see something a little bit differently through an artist's eyes. And that'll be temporary. It's on until the end of the, until graduation around uh, middle of May. Um, we've also been bringing art to the BRC, which is the large tower near the Med Center, the Bioscience Research Collaborative. And we've been commissioning work. I'm particularly proud of the work on the left, which is by Rice alumna. We are so proud when we have Rice uh, alumna as artists and Dornith Dougherty teaches at University of North Texas. She's a fantastic photographer and I would dare say scientist. She goes to the world's leading seed banks and learns how to use their um, high electron microscopes. And then she takes images of the seeds that they're preserving for, to save the future of our food supply. And it's a commentary on the environment. It's also an interesting partnership between an artist and a scientist. And it's, in my mind, sort of, she's just the perfect rice person. She's incredibly creative and she understands, she can speak to the science part. And these are made out of lenticular panels, which is a new technology that's almost cinematic. And it's, uh, it varies as you walk across it like a hologram. So these were beautiful. They were in the BRC this last year. And the work on the right is currently at the BRC. It's by a Houston artist whom we invited to embed in Rice, a nanotechnology lab run by a professor at Rice named Jacob Robinson. And they are doing really innovative uh, research around hydras, which are microscopic organisms. And she studied those hydras and they, uh, they are doing a lot of research that will help um, solve cancer and Alzheimer's and all kinds of things. I, I won't go too much into it, but it's a really exciting when we can partner artists with scientists and then the results um, are on view for the academic year. And then we've also been putting art, student art on campus. So we've, for the last five years, we've had a series of really amazing exhibitions in what I'm calling the Provost's Gallery. It's really a hallway in the Allen Center, but it's a space that's often activated. I mean, there, there are a million meetings there for both on and people on and off campus. And we've really been able to highlight, I think the creativity of Rice students by foregrounding their artwork and um, placing it in a really prominent location on campus. So that's been an exciting and fun project. Um, and then finally, the last temporary project, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, wrap up soon, but the last temporary project is the tent project. So these were temporary structures brought to campus um, for um, during COVID to expand the classroom space. And we've commissioned both local Houston artists. It was important to us during COVID to give local artists um, resources because their work basically dried up. So we wanted to take, take our, small, our small amounts and try and help them as best we can. And so we commissioned works like this. This is a Houston artist named Jasmine Zelaya. Um, this was a Rice Vada faculty artist, Allison Hunter, who made a video about bees and community during COVID. Um, the work on the left is another Houston artist by Delita Martin called The Gathering, which is also about healing and coming out of COVID. And the work on the right is by Karen Broker, who I hope many of you know. She's taught at Rice for 41 years in the Visual and Dramatic Arts Department, and she is just retired. So we invited her on the occasion of her retirement 
to activate one of the tents, which she did. And you see her here with her husband <laughs> being funny because she sort of put a table there, but it was really about bringing people together around the table and the importance of domestic life during the pandemic. Um, and then finally, I think I have one more. Yeah, we did, um, we worked with uh, Gonzo, a local street artist here who Rice students and faculty and even President Liebren and Ping contributed to this. I, I should have brought the picture of, uh, of David Liebren painting one of the triangles, um, but they painted a mural, which is part of the uh, part of the tent project. So that's been really fun. And we did other things like the color walk and the uh, student design competition with the School of Architecture. Um, and we have three new things coming soon. And then I'm gonna show you a video because I wanna hear from you all. And I realize we're running out of time. Um, coming soon. So more to come. We're not, we're not letting the grass grow. Things are happening. We are creating a new site specific mural in Alice Pratt Brown. Some of you might know those hallways. They're a little bare. So we are commissioning an artist named Odili Donald Odita. He's originally from Nigeria, now living in Philadelphia. And he is taking the colors of the sky space light sequence and creating a new um, abstract wall painting on the uh, in the student lounge and in the hallway of Alice Pratt Brown Hall. And it's really gonna transform that space into one that we hope will be newly dynamic. They're also gonna get new furniture. So it'll be super, super nice. Um, we are commissioning a work at Craft Hall, um, that, which is newly built as part of the Percent for Art program. And we're commissioning work at Hanson College, which is um, with a artist from Caracas, from Venezuela. So we're continuing along the path of activating these spaces where students live and work. If we have, um, I want to plug also that you can find all this on an app. So for those of you with iPhone, the students may, there is a student rice app club and they created an app for us that you can download for free on the app store. It only works if you have an iPhone. So they are still working on the Android version, but um, you can download on your phone this app and then it contains all the works that we have in the collection, which you can both read about, same information on the website. So it may be easier to read it on the, for me, it's easier to read it on the website, but you can also map yourself to it. So the next time you're on campus, I really encourage you to, um, you can see on the screen, this one leftmost screen that it shows the route. So if you wanted to get to that Michael Heiser, it's like Google Maps, you can click on it and then it can help you walk there. You can see that it's adjacent to Maxfield Hall. Um, so that was a really exciting, collaboration with our student app club. Um, and I would also say you can sign up for our newsletter if you want to find out more about both public art and what's happening at the Moody. On our on the Moody website, um, there is a form where you just at the very bottom, you have to scroll down to the bottom of the web page and then you can sign up for the newsletter. We only send it once a month. I we promise not to overwhelm your inbox. But I I definitely would encourage you to sign up because that's the best way to find out when what we're doing with public art, for example, this dance performance we're having at the Sky Space or any of the activations I talked about would will be on the newsletter. So that's really the best. Um, the app is the app is more static with just the collection and how to find it. And then our newsletter and our the Moody website is a better spot to um, to find uh, to find new activity if you as it were. So I, I'm gonna stop there. I do have a video. We're very proud of, um, we just released and, and really we just released it I think on Friday, um, a video. And I think what I'll do is I'll ask, um, I'll ask Karen or whoever, however you're organizing to email you a link to the video so you can watch. It's only three and a half minutes, but it's also, I will say, and we dedicated it to Raymond Brockstein. Um, and I just, I, I get choked up honestly, because Raymond and, and Susan as well have been so very critical to the development of public art, to initiating that first wave of acquisitions and commissions in 2008 and all the way up until three weeks ago. So it's he's been just a visionary and guiding light together with so many others. Um, but I just wanted to say that I hope you'll watch the video and I'll send it to you in the email so you can do it at your leisure. But with that, I'm gonna stop talking and I would love to hear questions or comments or, or anything at all from the group. We have about five minutes and I wanna reassure you that Amanda will send the video. Um, is, are, are there questions or comments? I want to know which was 
you put these people, generous people and wonderful artists. Did you ever have any difficulty or what was the hardest one to get it on campus and, and get it situated? Because oh. I know you have to contract all that. Yeah. Well, I, I don't, they're all a kind of a, their own project, but what I will say is that and I didn't speak to it today. One of the most important things we do is maintain the works on campus. And we're very fortunate to have an endowment funded by Suzanne Dill Booth. She trained as an, as an architect, she's an art, uh, art, art and architecture preservationist. And honestly, it is an ongoing process. We are constantly cleaning, polishing, repairing, replacing lights. And the most high maintenance one is the sky space. So just this last year, we replaced the entire irrigation system, all of the grass around it. We redid two of the speakers inside. We are about to replace all of the lights that um, on this, the lights that project onto the ceiling. And they're 10 years old and they've lived outside in Houston, Texas for 10 years. And that's a pretty good run. But at a certain point, all these things need upkeep. So we are constantly um, doing our best to conserve and ensure that everything on campus looks its best. So we want, we want everyone who comes to campus to see the work as the artist intended. And that's a, that's a constant job. So uh, each installation has its own set of challenges, but that is finite in nature, but the, the maintenance and preservation is important and that's ongoing. Ah, and you have to keep up with all of that. Um, I'm, Yes. There, there's a good question in the chat, which is, are all of the works featured on the website easily accessible to the public during the entire week? Yes. So I would say all of the works, um, I mean, you know what, I'll say this and then there'll be one. I think um, that Emily Mason painting is on the ground floor of the Alice Pratt Brown Hall, but it is behind a couple of double doors. And I think those doors sometimes lock. You can see it, but you can't get up close to it all the time. You can get up close to it during the working hours. Um, for the most part, yes. And I, I mean, there may be, uh, there may be something, but I'm, these are when, when we decide to put a piece of public art, our first question is what is the most public site? It's often outdoors. And if it's not outdoors, then we want it to be either the lobby or a major hallway. We, we don't do, I get calls from people who are like, I have a really bare office. Could you... <laughs> <laughs> we really don't do people's offices or even conference rooms. We try hard to really focus on public spaces that are accessible to the whole community, both the campus and the visiting public. So that's certainly our goal. It, it's not to say there's not, like the provost gallery I showed you with the student art, that's not really open all times. That's open during the business day, but it's also that student work is, it's a little bit different and it changes, but um, the large pieces in the commissions, it's super important that it's public. Let's give Allison a hand. It's wonderful. This is, um, and I'm so happy to know there, we, we can at our leisure look at this stuff because you all have got, got it all like in apps and, and on websites that we can see. I, I know that's a lot of work as well, and I appreciate it. Um, Piper, you have an announcement to make, right? Yes, we will have our first program committee meeting by Zoom on uh, April 21st, that's a Thursday at 10 a.m. And anyone who is interested in being a part of the committee, we welcome you, we want your input. And if you don't want to actually be part of making the choices, if you have suggestions for programs for the coming season, you can send them to me. My email is pipermadland at gmail.com and I'll put it in the chat. So I hope you'll, you'll join us and let me know if you're interested in joining us so you can get the link. Thank you, Piper. And we are excited about the upcoming year our lecture series and our author series. And so that we want your suggestions. So we'll get what our membership is or, and friends are interested in. Um, I, I have one more teeny thing to say before we go. I want to congratulate 
crew for meeting their challenge during the 24 hour challenge. Um, I'll tell you, you know, that was Thursday and Wednesday night, I was looking at the numbers and saying, oh me, oh my. And sure enough, I woke up and we had met our numbers and it was just wonderful. And I appreciate you all. We all appreciate everybody who contributed. Um, now I will give this back to Amanda and she's going to take our picture. And again, Allison, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It was lovely to see everyone. Everybody wants to turn their camera on. I'll do a little bit of a countdown for a photo and, um, there's two screens of us. So give me just a second to get everybody in it. Take the photo on one, two, three. Okay, then we'll go to the second screen. And again, one, two, three. Perfect. Thank y'all. Thank you, Amanda. Thanks to everybody. See you soon. We'll be in touch. <laughs>